Um, okay. Hello. Um, so first off, before I start, uh, I'd just like to say uh, a very large thank you to both Eric and Drew for inviting me here. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, experiments on stochastic games. So I'm going to try and move somewhat from what Guillaume was talking on infinitely repeated games to try and look to games with an evolving state variable. Um, okay. Um, there's probably going to be a random distribution of typos through these slides, like many of the others. Today, I haven't misspelt my own name, so I'm successful at the moment. We'll see how it goes. Um, so Guillaume talked about infinitely repeated games. So these are repeated interactions with a static strategic environment. So the summary, so I don't want to mischaracterize what he said, but the, the summary I thought from what his two talks was that subjects can use conditional cooperation. They can condition their future behavior on what happened right now to support more efficient outcomes. The basin of attraction predicts selection uh, in games with perfect monitoring. Um, and this behavior extends somewhat to imperfect monitoring, although the strategies get a little bit more complicated, they'll be fine. Okay. So I'm going to focus here on extensions to stochastic games. So my basic questions are going to be very similar to Guillaume's. Do subjects continue to use conditional cooperation in these environments? Uh, what elements of the game are they going to condition on? Once we have moving uh, states, we might condition on both the state and the actions. Are any particular variables going to be uh, focal? Can we again predict selection in these stochastic environments? So that's what I'm going to try and do. Um, the literature here is a little bit less well developed than the infinitely repeated games literature. I'm going to focus a little bit on some of my own papers. This isn't because of my ego. This is just because there's not so much literature here, and I actually have access to the data. Um, OK. So today, I'm going to look at very simple stochastic games. So going from one state in the PD game to two states. So the simplest extension to stochastic games that I can make. Uh, and then tomorrow, I'm probably going to be still doing a little bit of this at the end. I'm going to move to richer dynamic environments, so much larger state spaces or with a continuum of states. OK. Um, again, there's been some motivation. I still have some, some motivation, so I may as well just tell you it. Um, as Guillaume said, many interesting economic interactions, they're long-lived. He gave the example of a marriage, that if you're married, you know uh, we're in a repeated game. I'm not married, but I still know that there's many long-lived uh, interactions. Even if you're not married, you're still in this situation. Um, folk theorems can lead to severe multiplicity in our prediction. We're not going to have a precise equilibrium prediction that we can, we can go to. So we might want to see what gets selected by behavior. Um, OK, so we know this from what Guillaume was talking about for the past two days. Um, so we know a lot here. We don't know much about the much larger family of stochastic games. So I'm going to take, for the most part, small deviations from a region that we do know something about, repeated PD games, to one that we don't. I'm not going to dive just straight into the middle of the stochastic games family and start uh, running experiments. I'm going to move slowly uh, in small steps. OK, so this is a separate part of my motivation. So I'll first use what Guillaume said. Now I'm going to use what Johannes said. Many of these long-lived interactions that we think are so important are actually better modeled stochastic games. There's a strategic, uh, there's a state there which is evolving with the actions that the players are choosing. So a stock could be depleting or growing. So we can think about this stock as being fish in the sea, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, demand for our products, etc. These are changing through time, maybe as a function of our actions. We can have a new entrant who's coming into an oligopoly. This is a, a focal situation for I.O. problems. We have just a monopolist. What happens when we have a new entrant? What affects the new entrant's decisions to enter or current participants to leave the market? Or if we have the marriage example from Guillaume, marriages aren't forever or they don't have to be forever. We can leave them. We can make the choice to go into greener pastures or or brown pastures, I guess. It depends on whether it's a good or a bad choice. Uh, so we can annul the marriage. Okay. So we don't know much about behavior in these games. Um, 
just a quick outline. Sorry, there's a question? Or Okay. So the basic notation I'm going to use, I'm going to try and stick to Johannes's notation. I had different notation a couple of days ago. It's all changed, so there's probably going to be a couple of mistakes there. Sorry. I'm going to try and go with Johannes's notation, though. So like an infinitely repeated game, we're going to have some players. We're going to have periods, one, representative period T, unbounded. Uh, I'm going to mostly focus on uh, infinite horizon games. We have period actions. Where we differ is with the states. We're going to have uh, states that I'm going to force to be payoff relevant. I'm not going to allow these to be like automata states. The state has to affect payoffs. Um, so I'm going to take a pretty hard definition of what a state is. Um, I'm also going to think about these states as being exogenously given. We're not going to build up the state space uh, from the histories. Uh, okay. Rather than Johannes's notation, I said I was going to use it, and now I'm going to say I'm not. Uh, rather than use a conditional probability uh, for the state tomorrow, given the state and actions today, I'm just going to use a transition rule. So most of my games are, in fact, going to have a deterministic transition rule. So if you tell me what the state is today and the action today, I'll tell you a deterministic state. One or two of my treatments are, in fact, going to have uh, a stochastic transition rule. We're going to call those stochastic games. I'm going to call games with a deterministic rule uh, dynamic games. Uh, this, I think, was Mayerson and Samuelson's distinction. I don't know where stochastic games came from. Maybe someone else in the room does. Um, OK. Um, the only other difference here, we have period payoffs. Uh, that's standard, obviously. The history is going to be a little bit richer than in infinitely repeated games. That Not only am I going to know the sequence of actions that occurred, I'm also going to know the sequence of states, and I'm going to know the contemporaneous state, what the state is today. OK, so going to the marriage example, so starting in the same order Johannes did, I'm going to look at an absorbing game first. So we're going to take a PD game, so where we can cooperate and defect, and we're going to add the option to walk away. So this is going to lead to an absorbing state. Um, so my state space here is going to be very simple, just two states. Active, which is going to be where we start off from. So we start off with our new couple who've just met. Then we have the inactive state. This doesn't necessarily have to be reached. This is if we uh, break up, uh, so forth. Okay. Um, I'm going to use an imperfect public monitoring setup. This might seem slightly weird. I, why am I jumping straight away to imperfect public monitoring? This paper, when I came to it, uh, was somewhat motivated by uh, Drew's paper, Slow to Anger, that uh, determined that we find more forgiving and lenient strategies in imperfect public monitoring. And I thought to myself, well, it's all very good being forgiving, but if you decide that you're just going to abandon the relationship, that somewhat precludes forgiveness. Does the addition of termination lead to very different strategy selections in these games? Um, so to build this up, I'm just going to stick with the two players. I'm going to have three choices. Cooperate, this is going to be putting high effort into the relationship. Defect, this is going to be putting low effort into the relationship. And terminate, this is going to be serving divorce papers. Um, two public signals, success, this is going to be the, the good public signal, which is going to give us a large payoff. And failure, this is going to be the bad one. This is we had a bad weekend, no one's happy. Uh, then we're going to choose our actions for the next period. Okay, so what's the game setup here? I'm going to think about, if we get a success, the partnership is going to get $5, which is split equally. So $2.50 for each partner. Uh, if we get a failure, we get $2, which we split evenly. We're going to get $1 uh, each. Putting in high effort is going to incur a cost of a dollar. So here, if I get a success and I put in high effort, I'm going to get just $1.50 net, zero cents if I get a failure. So this is the basic structure. Here, what's the probability of getting a success given these action profiles? If we both cooperate, there's a 98% chance of success. So very likely. And there's just a 2% probability of a failure. One of us cooperates, one defects. We have a 50% probability of success. We both defect. There's just a 10% probability of success. OK? Um, so I'm ignoring the T for the moment. So if we take expectations. We look at this game. In expectation, this is a prisoner's dilemma. CC yields a payoff of 147 cents per period. 
uh, playing C when the other defects, that gives me 75, them $1.75. Uh, if we both defect, $1.15. That's the standard prisoner's dilemma. What am I doing? I'm adding the option to terminate, which can be unilaterally chosen. So if either player terminates the game, they get the payoff X for all periods remaining in the game. So this is the absorbing state. Johannes used the notation of star to say that once we end up here, we stay there forever. So this is the dynamics in this game. Um, yeah. Okay, so obviously, if I look at just the stage game, if X is less than 115, there are two Nash equilibria, but one of them we can remove by saying that Terminating is a weakly dominated strategy. So there's one Nash equilibria in weakly undominated strategies. If X is bigger than 115, if the outside option is better than playing joint defection forever, well, then there's at least three, there's possibly five Nash equilibria, but whenever X is bigger than 115, all of them involve a uh, joint... Drew, you look worried. One upper bound on X2? If X is too big, it'll be the, it'll be the only Nash. Sure, but when there be, I can, T and C, T and D, T, T, they will be uh, Nash, no? Okay. This is, uh, so there, there are, yeah. So if T is bigger than 175, one person at least has to play T. Um, um, okay, so that's the setup of the game. Um, without termination, if we look at just taking the convex hull of the payoffs, uh, here we have the standard uh, shape. Uh, here's CC, here's DD. The individually rational payoffs are those that are greater than the DD payoff of 115. If X is less than 115, the effect is to increase the feasible payoffs but if I additionally make a refinement of asking for individual rationality in weakly undominated strategies, this set of uh, payoffs I might expect in the game will be the same. So I'm not changing uh, what we might expect in this game. As I push X above the DD payoff, I change the set of individually rational payoffs. I can no longer sustain uh, a payoff below the point X because I have a simple deviation. I can walk away from the relationship. So whenever I expect the relationship to be giving me less payoff than my outside option, I go off into the larger matching market and make X. Um, okay, for simplicity, I'm just going to show some strategies. Uh, memory one, uh, symmetric uh, public perfect equilibria. So uh, the grim trigger, this one is I start out at success. I'm going to denote success. Uh, the, sorry, I'm going to start out cooperate. Uh, I'm going to denote, denote the starting state for this machine, machine states, not payoff relevant states, by the gray circle. Okay. If I keep on getting successes, I keep on cooperating. As soon as I get my first failure, I switch to defecting and I stay there forever. So standard strategy. This is going to be a subgame perfect equilibrium whenever X is less than 150. This strategy, which is more forgiving, uh, so whereas eventually this grim trigger is with the 2% probability of getting a failure if we both play this, we're always going to end up in the steady state being at this defect state. Whereas this strategy here, which I'm going to call mono, which kind of looks a little bit like a tit for tat like strategy, well, here we do the same thing. If we get a failure, we switch to the defect state. But now we sit here until we get that success, even though we're both defecting, with 10% probability that happens, we go back to the cooperating state. So here, the steady state is going to be, well, 2% of the mass is coming down here, 10% is going this way. We're going to end up with a more cooperative steady state solution. Um, this is an equilibrium when X is less than 124. So even when the individually rational action is to terminate, this is still going to be an equilibrium. Obviously, this is for X less than 115. This is the analog to the Grim trigger. I'm going to call this one strike. This is kind of the policy where we start dating. As soon as you do one thing that I don't like, uh, I abandon ship and go into find another relationship. Um, so this is a very unforgiving strategy again. Uh, so here instead, when I get a failure, I end the relationship. This is an SPE for X. Uh, here I'm talking about delta. Sorry, I should have been precise. 
Uh, I'm going to look at delta equal to four-fifths for this particular variable. Where does the 131 come from? Well, as, t as the value of termination continues to increase, it limits my ability to punish the other person. The punishment we're going to use becomes less powerful, so I can no longer dissuade uh, people from defecting uh, up here, if I was to use this. Um, and then the last strategy that's going to be important here is always terminate. This is just going to be the analog to always defect. Uh, this is an equilibria for any x larger than 115. Okay, um, so experimental design. What am I going to do? I'm going to run three sessions each with an x far below 115, where I shouldn't expect to see any termination, uh, just because it's far worse than remaining in the relationship at the worst out in relationship outcome. Three sessions with x equal to 125. So here I should uh, begin to detect some, some termination, maybe. Uh, I think with restriction to memory one strategies, I should, should certainly see termination here. Um, and then I'm going to get one session each with some variation of x for each increment of 10 cents between 75 and 125. And then I'm going to add in a really high termination value uh, of 135. So we can think about this as, uh, this is online dating where it just becomes very easy to find outside options. Does this stop us from cooperating within the relationship? This is this very high termination value. Um, okay. I also run three sessions where uh, I don't have termination as an option. Uh, these values in the matrix, they are dollars, right? They're cents. cents. So if I terminate in the best outcome, I have like one dollar of 35 cents. Uh, I have a, a, a stream payoff of one dollar and 35 cents. It's stream payoff. Okay. Yeah, so once I enter this state, uh, for every period of the game, I'm going to continue to get this payoff. Oh, okay. So this is the expected payoff of leaving the relationship, or discounted average payoff of leaving the relationship. You don't have to do anything else. There might be a bad thing in the experiment. It might be that they like taking actions. Uh, yeah. So you, you don't have any other agency within the experiment. Uh, it's, kind of an easy option, right? like it's like a nice, easy, prepackaged Grimm strategy, but where I have to take whatever payoff I've given you x. Um, is this OK? OK. Um, how do I set this up in the lab? So we were a little worried coming into this that it, I might not want to terminate the relationship because, well, I don't get to do anything for the remainder of this uh, indefinitely repeated PD game. So I might not terminate just because I want something to do. So the way we try to mitigate this, we're not going to get rid of it, but we're going to play two partnerships concurrently. So I'm going to have a partnership on my left and a partnership on my right. And I'm choosing actions within them at the same time. Um, so... Uh, yeah, the, what this means in terms of my, my metaphor to relationships is, is strange. Uh, more so that the matching takes everyone in the room and forms them into a large circle. So everyone, yeah, so let's not think about it. Um, the reason I match people into a large circle, if, I'm, if I have to match everyone to two players, well, at some point I'm going to get a, a, a cycle. So I wanted to stop the reflection of my behavior with my partner on the left somehow affecting my partner on the right through their interactions that's separate from me. So I try and maximize the distance between my left partner and my right partner. Um, I also do a fancy matching algorithm to make sure that I never have the same two partners in any uh, contiguous super games. So one and two, I'll definitely have different partners. I, I mean, I do. I, this is just for presentation to you. Uh, I end up making it A costs 50, B gives you 50. Um, but yeah. So it, that's just a, how I present it to subjects. I, in, I, I endow them with 50 points and say that A is cost me 50, B gives you 50. There's a lot of different ways I could do this. Uh, so I chose one. Yeah, to triads. Uh, but then there's like different additional equilibria with uh, triadic monitoring. Yeah, I mean uh, the key would be very different. Yes. Uh, it might be harder for me to sell that to a journal. I, well, maybe. <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay. 
So I'm going to use random termination with delta equals to four-fifths. So there's a one-fifth probability in each payment round that the next round won't be a payment round. Okay, uh, so question. Sure. So it may be that I'm dividing their attention and then pushing them towards simpler strategies. This may be a concern. I'm going to be varying, uh, I'm going to be keeping this constant while varying x. So hopefully this force will be equal across all of my treatments unless we think that uh, somehow the simple strategies happens more uh, in treatments where I should terminate and not in treatments where I should use in partnership punishment. Um, Maybe. There's another trade-off in that I, I'm also dividing their attention, but I'm also getting more observations. So there are a couple of different trade-offs here. Uh, it's going to be hard for me to say out of sample what might have happened if I chose a, a different institution, but you're, you're right. Uh, it may divide their attention and cause them to choose easier strategies. My interest is mostly going to be on whether they choose easy, uh, conditionally cooperative strategies, whether they're lenient or forgiving. Uh, so. Within that, I'll be able to tell you something. OK, uh, this is just the screen of what it looks like. They have option A, B, uh, N partnership. Here's partnership red, partnership blue. These are the way it's set up. OK, straight to results. I, I don't want to spend too much time here. Um, so what are we looking at here? Uh, what's this? OK, so this first column, this is the treatment without termination. So just the action C and D here, where the payoff is 75, 85, 95, 105. 135. So I'm just changing the value of x here. These triangles tell me initial cooperation rates. So I'm getting initial cooperation rates of about 60%. There's this jump here at S95. There's only one session here, so we might think about this as an outlier. That's how I, I tend to think about this. If I look at session level averages, I do find a significant effect for adding termination causes people to be more cooperative. So uh, here, these three treatments, these three sessions are lower than all of the treatments with uh, uh, termination as an available option. Okay. Uh, down here, these circles, we have what's the incidence of people terminating in round one? These are the people who just don't want to be in a relationship. Uh, there's, a small, there's an increase here at 105. We thought this should be happening at 115. We shouldn't see anything uh, below this, this could be coming from risk preferences potentially. So the lower bound payoff I can get within the relationship is 100. And then there's some 10% probability of getting 250. Here, this is guaranteed 105. It has to be pretty strong risk preferences, but they do begin to use termination for the first round here. What's more interesting is that they continue to use cooperation and um, this becomes a bit obvious, but by round five, the cooperation within active relationships has increased. I mean, obviously, this is going to come from a selection effect. I'm conditioning on the relationship being active, so those relationships which remain in round five are more likely to be cooperative. Here, the white diamonds, this is showing us in round five of the super game, what fraction of the uh, partnerships have ended. So here, I start out with a very small level, about 10 uh, to 15% for these treatments below 100. And then above 100, I see between 40 and 50% have reached the inactive state. Okay, so this is all fairly intuitive. My interpretation of this is cooperation doesn't change much. What happens is they alter the actions they're using to punish. They're switching from in-relationship punishments to outside relationship punishments by ending. This is all fairly intuitive. The gap, yeah, this is, uh, it's also round five. Uh, it could be that it, my block design, this is, exactly at the end of the block. There are small effects on the block design. I think across treatments, it's 
it's relatively small, but there, there might be a drop here just because they, they think with some high probability that the super game is going to end. I, I'm not sure what it looks like if I look at four. The reason I'm looking at five is I'm guaranteed to have observations in all super games up to round five. Um, okay. I use Guillaume's strategy frequency estimation method, and I don't find too much shocks here in the amount of cooperative strategy use. So there is a large, well, there's a 15 to 10% increase from no termination to termination over the initial cooperation rates. Guillaume, you're also looking worried. Oh. You open your mouth when you, when you read stuff. Um, so, uh, okay. Sorry, I shouldn't do that to my advisor. <laughs> it's not a good play. Um, okay, so ongoing cooperation, these are strategies which, with some positive probability, are going to play cooperation in each period after the first. Um, okay, so here it's pretty much the same. Where I do begin to see effects is people, when they use termination as strategies, they become more lenient. They accept more bad outcomes before they move to ending the relationship. Forgiveness, once I include always cooperate, I mean always cooperate doesn't have a punishment phase, but you can also think about it as having just instantaneous forgiveness. The forgiveness rates, including all C, are very similar. The main differences I'm spotting are the use of termination. This is just like a sensible outcome, yeah? This is just telling us they react to incentives. Okay. Um, so now I have three extensions. This slide was just saying, uh, summarizing a result. So this is what I just said, that the strategy choice is affected by the individually rational uh, policy. So uh, when termination is used, when x is uh, larger than the defect effect outcome, and also a bit smaller than it, uh, we tend to use, see strategies which are more lenient uh, when they're using termination. Um, okay, so three extensions. So this was kind of uh, not that much going on. It was testing a basic uh, response to incentives. Here I'm going to make the game a little bit more interesting. So I'm going to use asymmetric payoffs at the conclusion of the relationship. So if I end the relationship, we get different payoffs. We might get this because a contract says what happens when different parties take different actions. It may be that a court takes the assets of the partnership and distributes them asymmetrically. So I'm going to look at three institutions that I think I can motivate from the real world. Um, I'm not going to put Johannes's counterexample games in here because it would be, uh, they're interesting, but it's, it's, they're more about behavior. I want to also motivate institutions. So A first. This is a scenario where the person who terminates gets 125. So this is bigger than the defect effect outcome. And the other player gets 75, so less than this. If both players terminate at the same point, they get a 50-50 shot of 125 and 75. So expected payoff of 100. A last. This is a treatment where the player who terminates the relationship gets, still gets 125. But the person who was terminated gets a higher payoff. This is kind of like, if I get fired, I get a large severance payoff. So if I want to leave, maybe I want to induce the other person to try and fire me. Um, this is like golden parachutes, etc. And then my last treatment is probably the most complicated game. It's a game where I, I can't even characterize the equilibrium set. From talking to Johannes, I can't even show that individually rational payoff exists. Um, a judge, this is where when someone chooses terminate, we're going to have the fable of there's some judge with a costly investigative process, she's able to determine what the actions of the participants in the game are. The person who chose C the most, up to and including the current period, gets the high payoff. The person who chose C the least gets 75. This was just motivated by me thinking about institutions of termination, about a judge taking a divorce case, deciding through some moral process that one person is more deserving, and giving them the high payoff. Why is this a really nice institution? Well, intuitively it has the sense that I'm going to use it because it gives me a reward if I'm the, the good type, and it, it's a good punishment because it hurts the type who, uh, who's deviated. Um, why do I say it's a really hard game? There's more states here. The state here is really going to be active, inactive, most cooperative, uh, inactive, least cooperative, 
and I have uncertain information about whether I was or was not the most cooperative person. So this would be a game with hidden states. Um, uh, so, yeah. Okay, so those are the institutions. On any tie in these institutions, they get a 50-50 shot of each of the two payoffs. So X plus X on two. Um, this is what the feasible, this is what, I just, this is an example of a non-convex feasible payoffs because there are three absorbing states here. So obviously payoffs here are not going to be attainable uh, without a public randomization, randomization device. Okay, um, so just the results from the strategies. So I'm, I'm showing you what happens with X equals 125 here as a comparison. So A first, what happens? 93% of subjects end the game in round one in every relationship. This is a really boring experiment to be in. Everyone just sits there. At the start of the game, they all end the relationship, and then they have nothing to do until the exogenous random termination of this super game. Yet they all do it. They get an, a, a payoff which is Pareto dominated by joint defection. No one does well here. Like, this is a bad institution. So asymmetric changes to these payoffs in the absorbing state lead to very large changes in behavior. So a lot of Johannes' examples had, had different payoffs if we chose different actions in the absorbing states and were causing these interesting dynamics. We're getting similar interesting dynamics with small changes. Uh, it's not that small of a change, but it's a change. Uh, a last, cooperation rates are quite similar to the 125 treatment. So if I terminate, I get 125 for sure. Uh, here, the cooperation rates are quite similar. What happens is lenience drops and no one uses termination. Even though I can get 125 if I terminate, and I get 115 if we play joint defection, we get people not wanting to terminate. They always want someone else to end them, so they get the golden parachute. Um, a judge, I can't characterize the equilibrium outcomes. Well, I can tell you it's a very successful institution. So this idea that there's going to be some moral arbitrator who, tell, who rewards the naughty and uh, no, rewards the nice and hurts <laughs> the naughty. Um, here we get initially cooperative strategies of 96%. Huge, huge cooperation rates. Um, here, ongoing cooperation rates of 90%. Uh, very lenient, uh, pretty forgiving once you include the people using all C. We still observe some incidents of termination. So we don't, we don't stop divorce altogether by having uh, some moral... Uh, judge, we do uh, reduce it, but more than that, we increase ex ante cooperation. So there's less divorce because people are happier. Um, okay, I'm not going to say this is what we'll find in the real world. This is what I find in my little uh, experiment. Okay, little experiment, my, my good experiment, my big experiment. Okay. Um, okay, so result. Asymmetric outcomes on division do lead to much greater variation in the cooperation rates. I just chose three institutions with asymmetric payoffs that I thought I could motivate from the real world, I get very different behavior than I did with the symmetric payoffs. So suggest room for policy interventions over how we write contracts on termination clauses, how we construct our institutions. So, um, okay. Oh, sorry. This, I only have this institution. Um, you could think about also having a third actual player in the game be the judge who got some imperfect signal, I imagine it would still go through. It's the, the fear of uh, being the, the bad player and getting this low payoff, I think, is driving the higher cooperation rates. I haven't run it, so I, I, I can't tell you what happens there. Um, I thought it was a nice treatment. I, I, I thought about running it. Uh, referees didn't tell me to run it, so I, I, I'm not going to run it. Not in that paper. I might in the future. Um, yes, so um, the people who, uh, and it's okay, the, the, the most common one is a two-strike policy. So this is, I cooperate until I've observed two failures. So that you can think about the first failure is my written warning, the second failure is me getting fired as a worker. So for me to be cooperating, if you are also cooperating, the probability of getting two failures is pretty small, yeah? So for the most part, it is going to be those players. Why can I not use a one strike here? Um, 
the problem is if, if in the first round I cooperate uh, and we observe a failure, in the next round if I end the relationship and the other person actually cooperates in round two, we would have equal cooperation rate and I would get a 50-50 shot. This is part of the, the cycle that's stopping me from being able to, um, to solve for an equilibrium in this game. Um, but yeah, um, does that answer the question? Um, no, because I'm wondering, this seems to be like, uh, if I follow, which I probably didn't, uh, like uh, a more behavioral aspect. The this, this, this allow a, you know, extreme difference between how payoff is divided in case of termination. Um, uh, I mean, I can think about institutions for that would do this. So like if you think about uh, limited liability partnerships that there's no, some... I'm not asking about oh. the other institutions that do that. I'm talking about the players themselves. The fact that, for instance, they immediately terminate just because you get more when you terminate a little bit more than the other. So long as the other person doesn't terminate. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm not able to really pin down, I think... I, I, they coordinate on this is all I can really say. You, you're interested in why they... What is the reasoning behind why they coordinate? That I don't know. That, uh, uh, yeah, that I get 75 for the whole rest of the game. So you can... Oh, the ba so the way I interpret it... So it's a basin of attraction argument for always terminate versus um, what are the cooperative outcomes that would uh, support cooperation here. A one strike. Yeah, yeah. I thought you introduced just a small difference. Really, the, the, the uh, no, it's 125 uh, and 75. And it didn't check how it responds to a change. No. To a change in the level of the symmetry. No, I, I haven't. Um, the other interesting treatment I would like to do is just have fixed asymmetric outcomes as well. Um, so regardless of who terminates, one gets large, one gets small. Uh, if this means that the person who gets the large one can extract rents is an interesting uh, question. Uh, I don't do that. I, I think it's interesting, but I, yeah. I don't know the answer. I think Guillaume is right. It's that, that's not you can't distinguish really between the reason of attraction. It would be... Kind of a... I don't want to be the one who's... Uh, but if I could get this with 75 and 80, that would be yeah. uh, really remarkable. Um, so what's the, what's the limit on the difference between the lowest and the highest? How inefficient can I make the outcome by playing with this? Um, okay. So this game, it didn't really have interesting dynamics. I mean, it has dynamics and it has a state variable, active and inactive, but there's no real interesting transition between them. So I focused on uh, uh, public uh, subgame perfect equilibria here, um, but when we move to games with a rich state space with uh, on-path uh, shifts between the states, uh, it might be more interesting than our game with an absorbing state. In particular, when we look at uh, games with shifting states, with evolving strategic environments, the focus, particularly in applied papers, shifts from the set of subgame perfect equilibria to the set, a subset of this, Markov perfect equilibria. Um, so this is going to be those subgame perfect equilibria where subjects use Markov strategy profiles. What do I mean by a Markov strategy profile? Here I'm going to look uh, at pure uh, Markov for the most part. Um, so here this is going to be a mapping from the contemporaneous state into an action choice. So this is quite a restriction on the possible strategies when generally we can condition on the entire history. Um, these are strategies which do not depend on any element of the history other than the contemporaneous state and there's no time dependence. This is coming from the stationarity. Okay, so why, why do we commonly make this Markov perfect equilibria restriction? So philosophically, and I'm quoting from a paper where the author's in the room so I don't want to miscategorize uh, what they're saying. So this is the simplest form of behavior consistent with rationality. If I go any simpler than this, I'm likely, uh, in some games, to not be doing something rational. Um, bygones are bygones. This is that if we have a stock of fish in our pond, it doesn't matter what we did 
10 years ago over that state. What matters is the number of fish today. So all th this is like a price-taking behavior. All that we care about is happening right now. Minor causes should have minor effects. This is a notion of continuity. This is saying if we take a perturbation of the game, there are going to be equili Markov equilibria which are close to the Markov perfect equilibria in the original game. Is this right? Okay. I'm getting nods, so I haven't done something hugely bad. Okay. Practically, this is very useful for people uh, doing estimation or trying to construct simple models. Well, it's easy to solve these games with the standard dynamic programming tools we get taught in our first year. It reduces the multiplicity quite substantially. It's a subset of SPE, and in many games, it's a very small subset. These two things together, getting high pitched, uh, these two things together allow for econometric estimation. So having hopefully a unique Markov perfect equilibria and having this be easy to solve in a routine means that I can use uh, econometric tools to try and invert the equilibrium mapping to look at choices and try and recover parameters of the game. Okay, so this is the motivation for Markov. Markov's used across economics. So this equilibrium solution concept is used in theory, in I.O., in public finance, in political economy. There's also papers in environmental economics, labor, macro, economic growth. So it's used across fields. So this is my motivation that people use this. Um, some potential issues with this. Well, it's not always going to be the most efficient subgame perfect equilibria. In fact, in the kind of games I'm going to look at, it's not going to be. Our estimated parameters and then our policy recommendations on those parameters can depend on equilibrium selection. So let's say I'm looking at a Cournot oligopoly and I'm trying to work out what's happening under Markov. So I might expect them to be producing two-thirds A minus C. Um, what's going to be the effect of adding a third player? Well, I might think there's going to be uh, three-quarters A minus C. However, if they were initially at the collusive outcome, uh, and this addition of the third player leads to a breakdown in collusion, my policy recommendations were changing antitrust regulation to have another player would increase output by 12.5%. But in reality, it would increase it by 50%. So I might be quite far off on my policy recommendations. So we might like to know from behavior if subjects in the lab are capable of sustaining something better than Markov perfect equilibria, maybe multinational corporations are also going to be able to be capable of doing this. So this is kind of the, the converse of an argument for sometimes we see failure in the lab for complicated theories. Uh, so this is maybe because it's a function of the lab. Well, here if we see a success for a fairly complicated equilibrium selection, maybe we should think that that might also be common elsewhere. I'm preempting my results a little bit here. Okay. Um, so to show that this isn't necessarily efficient, uh, for the infinitely repeated PD game, there's only one state. It's a, sta it's a static environment. We can think about this state as just being PD. It's repeated all the time. There's a unique Markov perfect equilibria here, which is always defect. Um, so... Given the prevalence of conditional cooperation this, uh, that we find in infinitely repeated games, this tells us there's a sort of rift here. We, we have a large equilibria where we think about the most efficient outcomes as happening in repeated games. But then when we shift away to evolving state variables, we think about always defect as being the outcome we might be getting. So we might want to find out as we move away from the class of repeated PD games, towards evolving uh, stochastic games, what happens to selection? Can we predict as we make this move what happens to the likely outcome in behavior? Okay, so my main question in this next paper is going to be, given a stochastic game, do subjects select Markov perfect equilibrium strategies? So it's a, okay, it's a fairly simple dynamic game. This is gonna be the core game and I'm gonna take a lot of deviations around it. So we're gonna make sure we understand this one. And then once we understand that, I'll go a little bit quicker. So we've got two agents, one and two. They've got two actions, cooperate and defect. And I'm going to have just two payoff relevant states, low and high. And I'm going to use perfect monitoring this time because let's start from the area we know best. We know the most from what Guillaume was talking about, about perfect monitoring environments. Um, so I'm just going to call them low and high, C and D. Okay, so this is my main game. We have a low state. 
the stage game is a prisoner's dilemma. We have a high state, the, uh, the game is a prisoner's dilemma. The transition between these states is going to be endogenous, determined by the action choices of the participants, deterministically. I'm going to start out in low. If we both manage to jointly cooperate, we switch into high. So this is like the stock of fish in a pond. If we both commit to not extracting a lot this period, next period we can have a lot more fish in the pond, and that stock's going to be robust, so we could take more out of it. Why do I say that? It's going to require joint defection in the high state to come back down to the low state. Additionally, what have I got going on? This is a game, if I played this infinitely repeated PD game, Guillaume would tell me I should get lots of cooperation here. This game up here, this is a game that Guillaume would tell me I would get not a lot of cooperation. There is a very small difference between DD and CC. There is a much larger temptation to defect when the other is cooperating. Uh, more than that, I'll show you it's actually efficient to do asymmetric strategies. Um, okay, so everyone's okay with this game. I'm mostly, it's going to be a symmetric game. I'm always going to look at symmetric games, so I'll just show you the role players' payoffs from now on. Okay, any questions on the game? Okay. Delta's three quarters? The, the probability of what, sorry? From state to state. It's deterministic. So, so if we jointly cooperate, we're guaranteed to be in the high state next period. Uh, if we jointly defect, we're guaranteed to be in the low state next period. Otherwise, uh, we're going to be playing the same state as before. Why have I chosen this particular game? Uh, I chose this particular game because it's going to have a Markov perfect equilibria, which is going to choose different actions in different states. I want to try and test Markov. I, w I don't want to get something maybe less than Markov, which would be unconditional action, so defecting in both or cooperating in both. So again, I'm going to show you in a second that cooperating in the low state, defecting in the high state, is going to be the unique symmetric Markov perfect equilibria. It's a lot of qualifiers. Those are the qualifiers that they tend to use in I.O. Okay. I'm going to fix delta equals to three quarters. And in almost all my games, I'm going to start the, the, the game in the low state. Um, I already gave you the interpretation of the game. Um, here, we can think about these darker blue regions. These are the uh, feasible values within each particular uh, fixed stage game. So low state, high state. Here you can see that the high state is unambiguously better than the low state. Lowest payoff in high, bigger than the highest payoff in low. Yeah? So we're going to think about this as ordered. Um, yeah. Um, but feasible payoffs, I'm going to be able to sustain the entire efficient frontier here, which is alternations between CD and DC in the high state. So every efficient path has to look like joint cooperation in the low state, some combination of CD, DC in the high state. However, there's a symmetric, more efficient, sort of second best outcome, which involves joint cooperation. Um, I'm going to show you my restriction to this comes from a, a global restriction in my entire design. I'm not using this because I think it's the, the easiest. Um, I'll change it in the next two treatments. Um, okay, there are four possible Markov perfect equilibria here. It's fairly quick to say that MDC and MCC can't be Markov uh, or Markov perfect equilibria because if I happen to be in the high state at any period, I can change my action to D, get a static gain of 80, so 200 to 280, and I'm not going to change the continuation value if the other person is playing Markov, my one-step deviation uh, is going to give me a gain statically. There's going to be no cost dynamically. Yeah? Oh, oh, sorry, I skipped the slide where I maybe said this. Um, M, subscript 1, subscript 2. A of L, the first one is going to be the action I take in the low state. The second one is going to be the action I take in the high state. So MCD, low state cooperation, a uh, high state defection, yeah? Okay, um, so those two. Surprisingly, MDD also can't be a, a mark of perfect equilibria. Why not? Well, if I happen to be in the high state at any point, the discounted average payoff is going to be 1 minus delta 190, delta 60, delta equals 3 quarters, that's 92 and a half. But the individually rational payoff in the high state Payoffs, uh, individual rational payoffs are state dependent here. 
um, is going to be 130. I can guarantee myself 130 by keeping us in the high state forever by playing always C. So this can't be a subgame perfect equilibrium. So I'm left with this last outcome. I could show you that it satisfies one, uh, one shot deviation. Uh, well, trust me for the moment. So MCD, MCD is uh, the unique, pure, uh, symmetric Markov perfect equilibria. There are a pair of asymmetric Markov perfect equilibria. Does anyone know which ones they are? Or you want me to tell you? Um, so <laughs> playing MDD uh, and MDC is also going to be a Markov perfect equilibria. So this is where I force the person. One person is getting 130. They don't want to go down for precisely the reason I eliminated MDD. However, because I'm starting the game in the low state, we should never be able to get that sequence, uh, the efficient sequence uh, in the game under Markov. We would, in fact, get the DD forever outcome. Okay. There are also history dependence, SPE. In particular, the easiest one that we can think of just to show this works is I'm going to use symmetric, so the strategy which tries to cooperate, and it's going to use a reversion to Markov on any observed deviation. So I'm going to call the strategy SXY, the one that tries to cooperate and switches to the Markov strategy MXY on any deviation. Yeah? Okay. We can also sustain with S a modification to SDD. We can get an equilibrium where the person who deviates plays MDC, the person who is deviated upon plays MDD. Okay. Each experiment is going to be three sessions, 15 repetitions of the super game. There are going to be 14 subjects in each session, and I'm going to pay four random super games. I'm going to use a partial block design. So I want to get lots and lots of super games so I can see lots of different interactions. Uh, I also want to make the super games longer. I could change delta, but if I change delta, I would be able to get less super games in any particular fixed amount of time. So what I'm going to do is the first five periods, I'm not going to tell you whether the payment has ended. At period five, at each subsequent period, I'm going to tell you if the game has ended. So that, it's easier if I show you what happens. Uh, so we go through five periods. At the end of the fifth period, I show you in each of the rounds where the payment has ended. Here, in round four, payment has ended, so I'm only paid on rounds one, two, three, and four. I played round five without knowing whether the game had ended. If I got into period six, I will be told instantaneously after the end of the period whether or not it had ended. So if I use fixed blocks, I would have uh, a much larger expected game, game length. Um, okay, this is what the interface looks like. It's not, it's people choosing actions. We've seen things like this before. Um, the, way I, the way I do states here is they have a table called red, a table called blue. They know the transition rule. They're told which table they'll go to after the choice is instituted. Okay, results. This is the interesting thing. Okay, I'm going to be using these graphs. So here in the blue, I, I messed up my colors. I was using blue for high earlier, I think. Um, this is the cooperation rate in the low state. So the height of this bar is telling us the average cooperation rate in the low state. The first bar tells me super games 1 to 5. Second bar tells me super games 6 to 10. Third bar, 11 to 15. So here I can see what happens across a session as well. So the trend on these three blue bars is the across the session trend. Here the red bars are showing me the same thing for the high state. The white dot, this is telling me what's the cooperation rate in the very first period in low. The black dot is saying what's the cooperation rate in all rounds except for the very first one. So the difference between these is telling me something about the change in the cooperation rate with time. So if they were constant, this would be coincident with what uh, a fixed Markov strategy would be telling us, or if I had enough observations, a mixed one. Um, the fact that they're not is maybe already pointing to the fact that we're going to have history-dependent strategies. The other thing which is telling us that the Markov isn't in my data is that this isn't zero. The cooperation rate in the high state, it starts out at about... Uh, 60%, it drops a little bit over the course of the session to about 50% near the end. Okay. So, so what do you mean? So, so this doesn't seem consistent, no? It's not consistent with Markov, no. Uh, I, I'll what you see here is that cooperation goes down in both, in both days. 
Cooperation rates go across the session. We see uh, a slight retardation of the cooperation rate. It certainly doesn't go towards zero. Um, I think what ha what's happening here is actually more miscoordination. It's actually hard to determine from this. Maybe they're actually coordinating on the, the asymmetric outcome where they play uh, C every even odd period. So I'm going to break that up. I'm going to look at the super game level now and try and break out this aggregate level data. Can I ask you a more general question? I'm, I'm wondering about this experiment because really the advantage of a perfect Markov chain is its simplicity. But here it would seem also that just the extending the, the, the green strategy would be is a simple strategy that uh, if I follow you again, Will do very well. It will do, and we'll find that they are using that strategy so a lot. That, so, in your experiment, you really don't have the main reason for using a perfect Markov strategy because there's a simple strategy, namely the green strategy. Sure. Which is actually Pareto dominating. Just cooperate always. Cooperate sure, always. but the. the other guy, uh, defects, just, uh, but the Grimm strategy is always going to be fairly uh, computationally simple as well and might sustain. Uh, cooperation in much more complicated games than this. So that, that distinction would still work in, in other games where we do select Markov. No, I mean, I'm also going to show you... The prisoner's dilemma is not the, therefore the right basic game to look at. You may be very right. I'm starting from a situation where we know a lot about the behavior in the static environment, the repeated static environment. I'm introducing states. Towards the end, I'm going to introduce additional complexity in the state. I'm going to go from two states to 22 uh, when I have shocks. I'm going to go from two states to four states when I increase the, in the, the path of play. I'm going to show you experiments tomorrow where there's a continuum of states. We're going to look at dynamic common pools uh, and other games where we are going to find that Markov is selected. So for right now, I'm just going to go through this and try and show you that going from one to two doesn't alter behavior. And I think this is really intuitive. I think you've just got the intuition that, of course, yeah? I'm just showing you that your, of course, has empirical validity. Okay. So once we go to other deviations, I'll show you that the selection of Markov does change in simple games. There are other reasons for that selection. So, okay. Other questions? Okay. This is behavior um, at the super game level. So I'm going to take each particular super game interaction of the two players, and I'm going to look at the cooperation rate in the low state, and the cooperation rate in the high state. So this is going to be a pair of numbers. So for each pair, I'm going to round it to the nearest 10%, and I'm going to plot it on this ele an 11 by 11 grid. The more super games that are at a particular point, the larger the bubble that I'm going to give you. The vertical axis, this is going to be the cooperation rate in the high state. The, um, the horizontal is going to be the cooperation rate in the low state. If I never enter the high state, I, I can't really tell you what the cooperation rate there is. So this bottom line, the not a number, this is telling me what's the low state cooperation rate if I never got into high. Okay? So if we were to have Markov, we would be expecting most of the mass to be down here in the bottom right corner. Unconditional cooperation, this would be here in the top right corner. What do I find? The majority of the behavior is perfectly cooperative in the low state and some variation in the cooperation in the high state. I have 17% up here, 12% up here. The majority of the data is in fact down here in the bottom right quadrant. So if I just wanted to say for the four pure strategy Markov, which one does the best in terms of these quadrants, it looks like it's actually the Markov, but we do see more uh, cooperation. Okay, these are what some subjects look like. This is Uh, top right is cooperate, cooperate. Uh, bottom right is defect. Uh, uh, bottom left is defect, defect. So like the so largest, the largest Pardon? You have the largest <coughs> bubble, top right. Yes. Yeah. This is the. Uh, this I'm going to show you that cooperation rates. They are many people who sustain cooperation. So we might think about taking the square root of this number of the people who may be using Grimm or something. Um, but we also have the the majority of outcomes. The most the modal quadrant of these four. <coughs> is the quadrant associated with the Markov. That's all I was saying. OK, this is what some subjects look like, just to show you that I'm not doing some trick at the aggregate level. I've gone to the subject level. Here's a subject who's very defective. They play D regardless of what the other player done. Yeah, I can, I, this is a defect player. 
This is Super Games 8, 9, 10 through 15. So here this is period one in the Super Game, two, three. Uh, the first one is their behavior. The second is the behavior of the match subject. Um, the dotted borders are going to be low states. The sort of paler pastel colors, they're low states. The darker colors are going to be high states. We can't see any high states quite yet um, for this strategy. Um, so this is a player who looks like a Markov strategy, the, the always defect one. This is a subject who looks like MCD. So here, here's a strategy where they meet someone else who also looks like MCD. So we're going to see this alternating pattern of CC, DD, CC, DD. But if this person who meets someone who cooperates in the high state, well, they still play, uh, well, they don't here. Um, they still play D in the high state, even though the other is cooperating. They're not reacting. Um, so this person isn't perfect. The one thing they other do that also do that's not perfect is they meet someone who defects in the very first period. They revert to defection in the, the high state. So they, I think MCD is a good approximation for the subject. Here's someone who looks like the, the grim trigger strategy. This is cooperate with a reversion to the Markov strategy MCD. So many of their behavior looks like we cooperate in the low state, we go up into the high, we keep on cooperating. The vast majority of the people they meet are cooperative. When they meet someone who defects in the first round, they keep on then defecting, and then when they get down to the low state, they cooperate. So this is someone who's using a more sophisticated strategy, and it's not like a grim, it's something which reverts to the Markov strategy. So this is fairly sophisticated. Um, Okay, and there's tit for tat here as well. Tit for tat in this game is an amazingly useful strategy. Why do I say this? Well, it can sustain joint cooperation. Uh, if I meet someone who defects in the low state, well, I can sit there at the low state playing joint defection. If I meet someone in the high state who plays defection, I can actually switch to the e efficient path of alternating between CD and DC. The punishment path can actually be efficient. Okay. So these are what the strategies look like. I'm not going to show you any more. I just want to show you that I'm not hiding something about how the subjects play. They do look like the strategies I'm going to talk about. OK, I'm going to skip this. Uh, I'm going to estimate the strategies with a very simple set of specified strategies that I'm going to look for the behavior. So I'm going to put just eight strategies, no, nine strategies, the four Markovs, and a couple of uh, focal history-dependent ones. And I'm going to assess Given the sequences we observe, what are the weights on these strategies? So the Markov is used by about 21% of the population, or play that looks very much like Markov, about a fifth of the population. This grim tri the, the, the Markov trigger that reverts to this Markov, 20.6. So I think I'm going to end up with, in the steady state, a little bit more Markov-like behavior, because if this strategy meets this one, it ends up on a Markov path. And then I get tw uh, tit for tat at 25.4%. So this is kind of remarkable. This is saying that the three strategies we found in infinitely repeated games, always defect, the grim, and tit for tat. Well, these are the precise analogs of these. This is the analog to always defect. This is the Markov strategy profile. This is the trigger which switches to that Markov strategy profile and tit for tat. Apparently, we can't eliminate tit for tat in stochastic games. Oh, by the way, if I was thinking of how I would play this game, yes, I would be just, uh, I'd hate to play the game of corporate defect without any, like, just corporate defect, corporate defect, no matter what history, no matter what he's doing, hoping that the other uh, would be cooperating in the first round and that the other game would be jumping between quarters. I guess yes. it's a very efficient outcome. It is a very, I, I include that strategy. Uh, I don't find many people are successful at doing it, though. I've checked for it, yeah. Uh, I check. It's actually, uh, for this game, you can support as a subgame perfect equilibrium any efficient outcome. So any efficient outcome is supportable as a subgame perfect equilibrium. Um, but I only included a very particular subset because I, there's an, uh, a lot of them. What is the SCD? SCD is the symmetric cooperation that reverts to the strategy MCD ah. on an observed deviation. So the strategy you were saying is simple. Um, the, the Markov part's not simple, but um, yeah. OK, so this is nice so far. So now I'm going to start taking deviations. Um, so this, this result, this is, this is your intuition. When we go from one state to two states, we're unlikely to jump from lots of cooperation 
to no cooperation just because it's too complex. I don't find that, so we throw that away now. Now I'm going to try and begin to say what features of the game might lead to the selection of Markov perfect equilibria. This is going to be my entire design. I'm going to go through it in small parts. So this is the game we just looked at. This is my pivot. So this is like my weird spider diagram. So I'm going to take changes to the efficient action. I'm going to change the efficient action by making a change to the, the dynamics and making a change to the statics. I'm going to change the strategic externalities of the game. I'm going to take out the static externalities and I'm going to take out the dynamic externalities separately. I'm going to define these things in a, in a second and say what I mean by all these things. Um, and then tomorrow, <laughs> I'm guessing probably tomorrow, I'm going to talk about changes to the complexity where I'm going to add more states and see if the additional complexity required of this, in this game is going to push us towards Markov. Okay, so that's the plan of where I'm going to go through. Okay, so manipulation one, altering the efficient frontier. So I'm going to hold constant the payoffs to symmetric joint coordination, to joint cooperation, and I'm going to reduce the efficient frontier away from where it was in my pivot game. Um, so this way I'm also going to be reducing the temptations that affect. I'll make this uh, clear in a, in a second. There's two ways I could, could do this manipulation. I could reduce the temptation payoff from defecting when the other cooperates in high state uh, and fix the continuation value given some selection. Or I could fix the temptation payoff and I could reduce the continuation by altering the transition rule uh, psi. So um, the first one I'm going to do is reduce the static uh, temptation. So I'm going to go from 280 to 250. That's going to be my only change. You're, you're, I would think about it, you're making symmetric strategies which in, uh, enforce symmetric joint cooperation more focal. Yeah? I, I would say, okay, let me show you in this picture. So this was the original game. This is the new game. Yeah? So I just pulled back the wings. So here I'm making this outcome more focal because it's the unique outcome that maximizes the joint payoff. Yeah? So that's why I'm saying I'm making symmetric strategies more focal. I'm also, by pulling back these two points, making uh, it less tempting to take a defection from these cooperative outcomes. So, um, okay. So everyone follows what I've done. I've just changed one number from 280 to 250. Okay. This is the original game. This is the shift. So we no longer see this drop off in cooperation through the session. We see, if anything, fairly constant. Uh, we do see a slight increase in the difference in response in the first period versus subsequent periods in the low state. So this is that if I ever get back down to the low state, I'm much less cooperative than I was initially. So this is more evidence of history dependence. Again, uh, this is what it looks like at the super gain level. There's nothing uh, that different there. I've got a much larger mass point up here. Um, if I look at the estimates from the strategy frequency estimation method, now well, I no longer have what I had before. Now the three strategies which are most common, tit for tat, reversion to defection in both states. Uh, so reversion to an MDD strategy and cooperation in both states. So I've, I've got more cooperative outcomes. Um, okay, the other thing I could do is I could reduce the temptations dynamically. So the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to alter the transition rule. So instead of staying in the high state so long as I don't play joint defection, I'm now going to say you can only stay in the high state if we both cooperate. So what's the effect here? I go from this game. The feasible payoffs within the particular stage game are the same, but now these asymmetric outcomes are going to force me to go down into the low state. So I'm no longer going to be able to sustain any of these points on the frontier as discounted average payoffs. Okay, what happens? Again, we have a, a much larger jump here in the cooperation rate in the high state. So I reduce the dynamic temptation, very large cooperation rates, uh, starting off at around 95%, fairly stable. What does happen is that in the low state, if I ever come back to the low state from the initial round, I stay there more. 
There's not a lot of forgiveness from failure to get up into the high state here. The, the, all the, cha all, the only change I made was I changed the transition rule. Before, this action, this action, and this action stayed in high. Now, only CC stays in high. So I changed the dynamic uh, rule. Okay. Um, so within the super game, 70% of them just cooperate. If I look at the strategies, the most common is a reversion to uh, SDD. I didn't point this out, but my change in the transition rule did change the Markov perfect equilibrium set. MDD is a Markov perfect equilibrium here because the individually rational action in the high state changed from C to D because I could no longer unilaterally enforce the high state. So here, what I find is that many more people use this very unforgiving trigger strategy, SDD. Okay. Um, and similarly, MCC and tit for tat. Okay, so making history-dependent strategies more focal, either through the dynamics or through the static payoffs, leads to greater cooperation and less MPA, MP play. So if I'm going to have any selection criteria for these games, it should respond to both static and dynamic uh, temptations that affect. Okay? Again, these are all intuitive things that like, theory might tell us should be happening, or not should, might be happening. Um, okay. The other thing that's different in a dynamic game to an infinitely repeated PD game is the nature of the externalities. So the externality in a PD game is, is just over what payoff I'm uh, uh, causing the other person to get by changing my action today. In a dynamic game, my action also affects the transition. So there's a dynamic externality that I, I can potentially uh, inflict. So I'm going to try and then separate these two forces and see uh, the extent to which removing the dynamic externality and removing the static externality affects the selection while trying to keep other elements of the game constant. Um, so the reason there's a dynamic externality is because the transition is a function of the actions. It's endogenous. So one way I can turn off the dynamic externality is I can just have a random transition, entirely independent transition between the states. So I'm going to use a Markov chain. Um, so what are the effects of removing the dynamic externality? So my first manipulation here is I'm going to just switch to an exogenous rule, um, holding constant the, the stage game payoffs in each state. So here, the payoffs are the same in low and high. I'm going to start in the low state, and I'm going to use this random transition, starting in low, there's a 60% probability of switching to high, 40% probability of staying in low. If I'm in high, there's an 80% probability of staying there, a 20% probability of switching down to low. Yeah? Where do we get these numbers from? This experiment was planned, uh, so this was done after I'd run my sessions with the, the pivot game. So I set these numbers to be close to the incidence of high and low states that I get in my pivot game. So there's the same approximate payoffs at stake here. The unique Markov perfect equilibria switches. It has to be MDD now. Why? Because, well, I can't influence the continuation with my choice. It's random. So I'm going to have to play the stage game Nash in each of the two states. Okay. So here, here's my behavior in my pivot game. Here's my behavior where I remove the dynamic externality. So what we see is a crash in cooperation in both the low state and the high state, but primarily in the high state. There are some initial attempts at cooperation in the low, um, much less attempts at cooperation in the high state. Um, if I look at the super game level, the vast majority of people are playing defect in both states. Here I get to observe because there's some probability they go to the high state. I'm not getting so much on this not a number because of that. Okay, if I estimate strategies here, the Markov does really well. I get 58% of uh, outcomes coincident with the Markov perfect equilibria. Drew? Um, 
Markov to the apparatus is we have non-trivial Markov fragments. So it's not clear how to think about this thing to be Yes. It, more it's the looking at the difference in cooperation as I turn off the... That's what I think is the interesting thing. Um, it was impossible for us to get uh, MCD in this game if we didn't have the dyna if we had exogenous uh, transitions. Um, okay, so without the dynamic externality, subject's cooperation falls quite markedly. So one thing that I might want to do is I might want to say, well, what's the effect of the dynamics on itself? So one thing I can do is I can just turn off the dynamics. That's going to remove the dynamic externality. Um, so in my second manipulation of the dynamic externalities, I'm going to just randomize what the starting state is. It's either going to be low or high with 40 or 60% probability. And I'm going to make the transition rule, whichever state you're in, you stay in. So I'm going to play each of these games as infinitely repeated games. But within the session, there's the same level of complexity in the instructions, in what they're seeing. Uh, all I'm changing is which super game they're playing. Um, so here's the rule. The starting state is now random. But whichever st state I start in, that's the state that I stay in for the entire super game. Too many S words. OK. Again, this has a unique Markov perfect equilibrium of always defect. So relative to the last game where I had dynamics, but without a dynamic externality, I get much higher cooperation rates. So Guillaume's uh, basin of attraction would tell me that I should get decent amounts of cooperation rate here, and I do. And it tells me I should get very low levels of cooperation here. I do, in both of these cases, they're lower than I get. Uh, sorry, they're higher than I would get when I had the dynamic game with exogenous transitions. They do find coordinating on strategies in this stochastic game hard. So having moving stage games does make it hard to cooperate, which makes the success in the endogenous game all the more impressive, I think. OK, I shouldn't say impressive about my own papers. Um, OK, so this is what the super game cooperation looks like. I never have a super game with both low and high, so I have to show each thing on the not a number line. That's why it's there. Um, OK. Uh, strategies used, again, MDD, always defect, ends up being the most prominent strategy here. Uh, this is, I think, for the high states. Uh, there is some attempts at uh, efficient alternation between CD and DC in the high state, but people start out by defecting. They want the other person to cooperate, and then they'll switch to this alternation CD, DC. Um. Another... I'm sorry to interrupt. Another variant in, in between always play high or always play low and the stochastic uh, uh, alternation would be to, to have a, uh, to just help to alternate back and forth exogenously. Oh, yes. Uh, and and it, there you've got. An easy state variable. Mm -hmm. An easy state variable, yeah. Yeah. Uh, easy even. state variable. Hmm. But maybe somewhat less than when you always stay in one state. Yes. No, this would be... Um, this paper literally got completed uh, a couple of weeks ago. So it's, uh, but it's a little bit too packed with treatments at the moment is the problem. So for future papers, packed with treatments at the moment. Yeah. That spider diagram is all of the things we have to talk about. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, oh, no. Weird latex stuff. Okay. Um, so stat subjects do respond to the absence of dynamic externality. I apologize about this slide. This is what happens when you change latex code at the last minute, apparently. Um, so subjects respond to the absence of dynamic externalities and move towards the MPE. So this presence of a dynamic externality was helping them coordinate on conditional cooperation, on a history-dependent play. Um, if I can read this. Um, okay, that's, yeah, let me skip that. Okay, the other thing, so I, I could took out the dynamic externality, but I could also try and remove the static externalities. So I'm going to move from a PD game, I'm going to move to a common pool game. So I want to remove the effect of I's action on player J. So I'm going to ask that this is going to be a constant. So I'm just going to choose an action, and I'm going to get 
a definite payoff based on that action. Um, yeah, so I want this requirement. Um, so I have two parameterizations here. Um, one, I'm going to fix the game to have the same tensions as the MPE strategy in my original game. And in the second, I'm going to have the same efficient frontier as my, uh, as my core uh, pivot game. So I'll um, show you what this is. Ah, no. Okay. So the dynamic common pool with a Markov parameterization. So I'm going to change the payoff here to 100 and the payoff here to 125. So if I play D in the low state, I get 125 for sure this period. If I play C, I get 100 for sure. Up here, if I play C, I get 130 for sure. If I play D, I get two, uh, 190. Yeah? In my efficient parameterization, uh, I get this is all the same. It's 100 and 125. All I'm changing is instead of 190, the payoff from choosing to defect should be 280. So it should be 280, 280. I don't know why the, yeah, it's not working. OK. Um, well, I do. It's my fault. Um, OK. There's two symmetric Markov perfect equilibria here. I've set this whole system of games up so that, for the most part, MCD was my constant equilibrium MPE prediction. But MDD also becomes an MPE here. Um, OK, so if I look at this game, when I go from my core game to the parameterization with the Markov, so 130, 190, I get a large, I get a drop, uh, not so much in the first period, but definitely in later periods, in the cooperation rate in the low state. I also get a pretty large drop in the cooperation rate in the low state. So this is, this, this in the high state is a move towards the Markov strategy. But up here, it's a little bit more moot. Uh, it's unclear what it's doing. If I look at the efficient parameterization, so this is 130 and 280 are the high state payoffs I can choose. Here, this is getting much closer to Markov. I get very high levels of cooperation, especially initially in the, in the low state, much lower cooperation rates in the high state. This isn't perfectly Markov, I know. Um, if I look at the super game level, uh, this is for the core PD, dynamic PD game. This is for the Markov parameterization of my dynamic common pool. This is the efficient parameterization. So in the efficient parameterization, I'm getting 41% of the people choosing the most cooperative Markov perfect equilibrium. Oh, their, their choices match it. Um, this one is actually going to be coincident with uh, having an a MCD strategy. Okay, um, how much time do I have? Uh, okay, yeah. Um, so here, let me skip this maybe. Um, if I look at the strategies which end up being selected, so this is using strategy frequency estimation method with this fairly sparse set of strategies inputted to it. Well, in my core game, I get 21% Markov. As I switch to the, the dynamic common pool without these... Uh, static externalities, it increases by a small amount, but when I have the same efficient frontier, the same uh, temptation, I get 65%. So removing these static externalities also seems to be pushing us towards the selection of Markov perfect. Um, so this is without introducing additional complexity, just changing the nature of these externalities. Um, okay, so I'm going to skip the rest of that. Um, Okay, so one thing we might want to do to try and extend Guillaume's results on selection is to try and think about are there common features uh, in these games that I've looked at that might uh, dovetail with the basin of attraction. So Guillaume in a repeated game was talking about the basin of attraction between a grim trigger strategy and always defect. So we can calculate the payoffs to both choosing grim we can calculate the payoffs to both choosing uh, to both choosing always D, or what happens when we miscoordinate when one of us chooses grim, the other always defect. We can just go through the game and work out what these payoffs are, and we can find the Q star that makes the rogue player indifferent if the other is choosing their strategy according to this randomization. So the larger is Q star, 
the greater the belief requirement on the other cooperating. Um, okay. So one very simple kind of like, without even thinking about it, extension is going to be, well, why don't I replace the Grimm with the strategy which reverts to the Markov profile? Why don't I replace the always defect with the Markov profile? So this is going to be, if I think about Guillaume's selection index in that way, it's simply SD and MD in his one state game. So uh, this is just the cooperative outcomes with an MPA trigger and the MPE. So I can equally well extend this to stochastic games. So here I'm going to have, this is, I changed my slides at the last minute, I make lots of mistakes, I'm sorry for this. Uh, here, what is the utility I get if we both play the cooperative outcome? So this uh, we can work out. I play the cooperative outcome and the other person chooses the Markov strategy. Note that this doesn't realize the strategic uncertainty until the second period. Both these strategies will choose the same thing in the first period. It's only when I get into the high state that I'll realize that we've miscoordinated. So they're a little bit more sophisticated than before. Um, and I can do the same thing. Let me end with this. Um, so I can do this for my core game. I can calculate what the discounted average value for these strategies are. I can then calculate what Q is. Uh, I can calculate the size of the basin of attraction between these two, th two strategies and say that it's 0.245. So the basin of attraction here said that's quite low in Guillaume's uh, world. And this is going to suggest we might get a lot of cooperation. So what I can do is I can take the games that I just talked about and I can plot the size of the basin of attraction here. And I can look at what's the fraction of the strategies that I assess which are above the MPE in their cooperativeness. So I'm looking at this in an efficiency sense. So for my pivot game, I'm going to be looking at SCD, uh, MCC, uh, any of the other conditional cooperation strategies. If I plot this line, there seems to be a fairly nice relationship which mirrors the relationship that Keown had. This isn't going to be perfect. So here, especially this, is this outlier here is the one with the, where I changed the high transition rule. I'm assuming that they're coordinating between MCD and uh, SCD. But what we found is that in that experiment, people were actually using SDD. They were using a, a, a harsher punishment. So I'm not able to capture all of these little details, but there's going to be a trade-off here between parsimony of this selection index and what I can predict. So I don't have enough experiments. I don't have a meta-study. I can't tell you that this is robust to 2,000 subjects. I have 300 subjects. Um, what I can tell you is that as a rule of thumb, the basin of attraction, which kind of brings together the trade-off between efficiency uh, and the Markov, and the temptation to defect does fairly well. Drew? Uh, I think it's 351. The average number of subjects is uh, 46 per. per tr yes. Uh, if I had uh, a larger budget as a faculty member, I would have more. Or done, I could have done, yeah. So there's a breadth versus uh, confidence, with trade off. Um, so I'm just going to conclude there. Tomorrow I'm going to go and look at richer dynamic environments. So, okay. So thank you. Oh.